Southern California, yeah. Born and raised our DNA, laugh and cry to what we say, we hit you with that wordplay. 4053. What episode are we on? D, they feeling like they be zombies, all dressed in Abercrombie. So Cal DNA coming in live, 8 o'clock on a Wednesday night. COVID got you sitting inside, why not sip one and free your mind? Cheap thrills, popping pills, stat cash, spend it fast. Listen to all of those lies as Arjun act like he's surprised. surprised. Oh, it feels good. So good tonight. I got two W's so far. Waiting on my third right now. Waiting for the Dodgers game to end. We apologize. We're coming in a little late. You know, you could kind of expect that from us nowadays. But we're coming in a little late. But still coming in hot. Coming in hot. How are you doing, eh? I I am doing fantastic. And I wanted to wish you a happy podcast day. Happy International Podcast Day. Yeah. Hey, check that out. this This is a relatively new thing. Okay. Um, but basically, I was on Twitter earlier today, as I usually am, checking the news. <laughs> and uh, it turns out September 30th is International Podcast Day, uh, a celebration of the power of podcasts. Hell yeah. And, you know, it, it's one of those gimmicky holidays, like you got the National Waffle Fries Day, Pancake Day, delicious, Cookie Day. Delicious, delicious. Delicious, all delicious things. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was the uh, first one back in 2014 in the United States. And uh, ever since then, I guess they kind of do it every year promoted by spotify of course shout out one of our latest platforms and Hell yeah of course for those of you that missed the uh, last episode we had a big announcement um we are officially distributing on spotify uh apple music uh google podcasts and, and like a plethora literally a plethora of other platforms that we've never even heard of but we encourage you to check out the podcast on as many platforms as possible um so it's it's a great time for so caldini we're definitely expanding we're definitely moving on to new ventures. Um, and, uh, you know, this week in general has been very exciting as well for obvious reasons. The Lakers, don't. The Lakers are in the playoffs, are in the finals, excuse Hell me. The Lakers yeah. are both in the playoffs and the finals. Hell first time. Yeah. First time in 10 years, man. I mean, how does it feel? How do you feel today? It feels fantastic, man. That, mm. my Dodgers are also in the playoffs. Mm. Um, but more importantly, because we are going to stick to basketball today, you know, we were just watching the game. Um, as petty as you are, given our little side deal going on, um, uh-huh. I know you're deep down on the inside, deep, deep in, down on the inside, happy with the performance that our team had provided to us, has showcased to the world. Once again, they were looking prime. It was yeah, crazy. Um, I, I was uh, overjoyed. Um, I, I started watching. Uh, I think probably ended the second quarter, and and even then, I could tell that the Lakers were in the dominant position. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were controlling the game, controlling the tempo, uh, hitting threes really, really efficiently, too, mm-hmm. which is a rarity for them. Yep. Um, well, actually, not really. I mean, granted, this is kind of an anomaly, and Rondo didn't show it today, but Rondo. In the bubble, has been hitting forty five percent at the three line. That's impressive. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, we, we know Rondo is probably one of the worst three point shooters exactly. on the team, but for him to shoot at a forty five percent clip, that is really impressive. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just have to say, you know, there will be many detractors for both the Lakers and LeBron James efforts, primarily because people will say, oh. Of course they're supposed to win. They're facing the Miami Heat. It's not Giannis. It's not the Clippers. Yeah, the it's Skip the Squad. Heat. I call them the yeah, Skip Squad. Yeah. The Skip Squad. <laughs> referring to, of course, the uh, uh, FS1's undisputed co-host, Skip Bayless, who um, has a lot of, I would say, a lot of enemies. A lot of enemies out there. A lot of hate. Uh, a lot of hate, for sure. Uh, and, and I'll just say, you know, I think winning a championship is very difficult everyone knows this only one team out of 30 does it every year but not only do you have to have a really good team with good chemistry and coaching and defense and everything you have to have a lot of luck and i mentioned luck because injuries are part of the game right oh let uh, me hear it let me hear it should i get my yeah. tiny violin out really quick well you should wait a little bit while i set it up um <laughs> so <laughs> I, I i know that uh injuries happen at the most inopportune times. You look at the Golden State Warriors losing Klay Thompson, losing KD, yeah. like the same game that they got him back. 
Yeah. And of course, because of those injuries, Toronto <coughs> Raptors with Kawhi Leonard, they were able to win a title for the first time in their history. One, one of many reasons. Okay, don't I wouldn't say it's the reason, but it is one of the reasons. I would argue, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that if Clay and KD never got hurt in that series, the Warriors would win. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just trying to devil's advocate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. devil's I'm advocate only sure. works if you have a credible point to make. Hey, man. But clearly whoa, in the whoa. D's case. Hey, yeah. hey. Yeah. as proven yesterday, don't need that. You can play devil's advocate to anything. As long as you're loud enough, it's fine. <laughs> yes, that is true. And, and, and what, what Don we'll, get we'll get to that later. We'll get that. We will get to that later. <laughs> yes. So injuries, right? Um, I only mentioned that because today, as I was watching the game, I noticed a couple of things happen. First, AD suffered an injury scare yeah. in the first half. Yeah. Um, it looked like he was going for the ball at the same time as LeBron. He might have had some kind of a finger jam, and you know how scary those can be. They could easily become a finger fracture. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he went to the locker room. I'm sure he got x-rays, and it turned out to be okay. He played on. Jimmy Butler, he fell down as well, and uh, he had a pretty bad ankle sprain. Mm-hmm. And he played on. He's a tough guy. No, yeah, and shout out to Jimmy Butler, dude. I didn't think that they would um, put him back in, nor would Spolster, like let him go in. Even um, mm-hmm. our buddy Van Gundy was like, why are you going back in? Like, do you really think there's a chance at that point of the game? And uh, so shout I gotta out to say, Jimmy Buckets, you know. And also shout out to JVG, uh, Jeff Van Gundy, because I thought he, he was really on point today. He yeah. had a couple of critiques like, you know, I haven't checked, but I'm sure ESPN statisticians would say the Miami Heat have less than a 5% chance of winning this game if Jimmy <laughs> Butler comes back. So why bring him back? There's no point. And then some guy, some statistician actually came by the desk and re- reported the official numbers from ESPN. And apparently they have less than 1% chance to win. <laughs> you know, so JPG was actually generous with the five. Um, but, you know, I, I think with Jeff Van Gundy, and I'll briefly mention this, as much as I love him as a commentator, I would like to see him coach again. I would like to see him get an opportunity. And I think, given what we know about uh, Doc Rivers, uh, you know, he was recently let go by the Clippers. Shocking move, but many would argue he was a scapegoat somebody had to take the fall and unfortunately they had to let go one of the best coaches in the nba today Mm -hmm. but now with the vacancy there all of a sudden it is nba's most coveted coaching position and adrian mojnarowski said you know ty lu of course is a candidate but jvg jeff van gundy may be coming out of the booth and becoming a candidate as well so you know and that makes me think man do you want a veteran coach or would you want someone that's kind of uh bambi eyed so that that way your superstars can really uh shine and lead the way they'd want to uh, you know lead the team because i assume that the superstars of the clippers had a say in regards to who took the fall um without question without question so Um, i you know it makes me wonder i mean ty lu would it's pretty much still Bambi. Like I'm pretty sure he's no, just sitting there, no, and, no. and uh, Doc's no, like, no. "Yeah, all right, let me let me teach you a little bit something of uh, this thing no, called a- coaching." No, absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. I, I think that is a totally you know horrible take that you're giving. Uh, Ty Lu led the Cavs. Well, I shouldn't say led, but he was there when the Cavs won a championship. <laughs> okay, he was there. There was obviously he was him. there. He was there. He, he was on the bench. He was there. So he has head coaching experience, whatever that means. Um, but beyond that, I think Ty Lu is a more experienced coach than, let's say, a Steve Nash. Because when you said Bambi eye, when you said Doe eye, got it. I, I was thinking, completely new. I mean, I mean, a younger yeah. coach. Okay, I get what you're saying. Ty, to me, Ty Lu is has been carried throughout yes, his career in more ways than one. Yes, um, both as a player and as a coach. Um, and Steve Nash, I get what you're saying. Is Bambi eye? It's his first time, kind of at. Riding this rodeo and having a good time with it, hopefully, uh, in the hard streets of Brooklyn. Not as hard as the streets of Mesa Court, but you know, in Brooklyn. Um, Dude, does Mesa Court really have streets? I guess. I guess yeah, kind yeah, of. yeah, yeah. We got, we got a little path, see, and they're never straight. Or we got a couple straight ones, but you gotta you get to the curvy ones. One wrong turn, you're done. You're lost. <laughs> good luck getting home. 
you know? That is true. That is true. Um, uh, yeah. But no, and, I mean, how long has it been since uh, Van Gundy has coached? It's been years. I think last time he coached was on the Knicks, right? Uh, I think it might have been Patrick Ewing. So Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, 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 was no. It? No, you don't think no, so? No, no. Because so? he, he oh, coached no, he McGrady for a bit, uh, and he was in Orlando for a bit and everything. Yeah, yeah no, he's he's been... Oh, he coached uh, Orlando after New York, you mean? Yeah, yeah. He's had time. Huh. Yeah. Sick. Actually, huh. you're right. He did coach T-Mac. I remember that. Yeah, because yeah. They used to have T-Mac on the ESPN show sitting next to Van Gundy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, he was uh, the coach of the Knicks until 2002 when he resigned. Yeah. And well, then he went to the Rockets in 2003. Good. That's where he got T-Mac. Ah, that's right. I remember that now. I remember that. But it seems like he retired when? Like in 2017? Like around there? I no, would say much earlier. Much, much earlier. much earlier. Okay, well, I was reading the yeah. Wikipedia article. I would say when we were in college-ish. Maybe even earlier. Uh, or he started phasing out at that point. Oh, no, he was fired in 2000... What is it, seven? Six? Something around there. Yes, yeah, so when we were in college, around that time, he was slowly transitioning to becoming an analyst. It is interesting, oh, though, looking at his record, pretty much his best moment was losing in the NBA Finals back in 1999. There we go. Wow. Good for him. And since, since then, it's all been downhill. Like, he even missed the playoffs a couple times and lost in the first round repeatedly. And, you know, he probably had T-Mac during that era as well. So yeah. it's not a good look. Not a good look. But, you know, I'm, I'm of the belief that if somebody who was once a coach now a commentator is given an opportunity to coach again i think it's a gamble worth taking because the players know him well right like anytime you watch a game you know jeff van gundy's voice sure and you may pay more attention to him you may respect him more because of that as opposed to let's say a veteran coach that has been coaching every single year and maybe coaching against you not really winning much it's different right so to kind of go back to your question for the clippers specifically i actually think they need a veteran coach because there's a lot of strong-minded people on that team Mm. and i'm not just talking about the stars i'm talking about the patrick beverly's of the world Mm. i'm talking about uh you know even lou williams Mm -hmm. lou williams is not a chump he is a vet a vet's vet for sure and and trey right montrez harrell who Um, may not even be with them Oh, is he uh, is he a free agent? Yep. Yep, wow. and I don't think they have enough money to pay him what he's worth. Well, I take that back. Sorry. Uh, given his performance in the playoffs or in the bubble, his value actually went down significantly. So they may have enough to pay him, but I would expect, if anything, if they do re-sign him, to sign him to like one of those basically one-year deals or one-plus-ones. Um, you know, and, and if I in. was if I was Harrell, I, I would, you know, negate that. I would go for as much money as possible because the player that he is, I don't think he was meant to be a star. He was meant to be a role player, I think, yeah. for his whole career. Yeah. And if he's kind of in the peak right now, coming off of Six Man of the Year award, he should take advantage. You but know? no, and th- that's why I brought it up, where his performance in the bubble wasn't up to you know, the standard set. I'll, I'll say I, I know it, it, it puts a, you could say, a tarnish over yeah. his stellar season. But yeah. I think NBA teams look beyond that. I don't think everybody's focusing just on the bubble sure. play. Sure. I and think he's, a, he's a dreams. potential starter elsewhere, for sure, easily. You know you, you know what would be the perfect team for him? Houston. I think uh, in that kind of a system, I know Dan Tony's no longer there, but assuming they still run a run-and-gun, up-tempo offense. <laughs> they have no Her- choice but to. <laughs> I know, I know. But Harrell fits that running gun style really well. I get it. Yeah, and he'll play dirty in the sense that he'll he'll do the dirty work. He'll get the exactly. boards. He'll, he'll box exactly. people out and all that. Um, That's right. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. If he really wants to we, chase money, I'd go to the Knicks because they seem to offer stellar money to subpar stars. I mean, they, they gave Randall, like, what, $80 million yeah, or something? $60 million? Golly. Good for him, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm all for the players getting as much money as possible, but at the same time, it, it's a little bit annoying for the Knicks to keep fucking up. 
like year <laughs> after year. You know, I, I was of the belief years ago when I first started following basketball that the NBA is better off when the big market teams are doing yeah. well. They are. And that is true for the Lakers. Mm-hmm. But for the Knicks, it doesn't seem to matter. Like, they could be the shit show. They could be a total shit show every year. But guess what? They're still one of the most lucrative franchises in the league. Yeah. And they'll keep being that way. Yep, you know? and the same thing goes for any New York team. I mean, the Giants, for example, are a prime example um, where they never really have a great year. They'll have, you know, a championship maybe once every 20 years, but they're still relevant just because of the market that they're in. Mm-hmm. So uh, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. It will be. It will be. But baseball talk aside, uh, because <laughs> we, we, we typically don't uh, cover baseball too much, but I do respect that Don is a big fan of Los Doyers. Los you Doyers! Know. There you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, Dodgers, they always have a, a good team in recent years. Mm-hmm. They they haven't always been able to make it all the way, mm-hmm. but um, I'm optimistic this year. I, I hope that oh, yeah? all the stars align. There we go. And, uh, you know, I, I hope for your sake, Don, they win a title I for you. I fucking hope so, man. It's been a rough yeah. couple of years, dude. I mm-hmm. know. I but yeah, no. Astros. I mean, more importantly, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think our focus should be on the Lakers. We should close it out, hopefully, by Sunday. I'm expecting a sweep given today's performance. Well, Sunday would be Game Three, so is it? Oh, would... today's Wednesday. Shit, I thought today was Monday. Fuck it. Yeah, close it out on fucking Sunday. That's how hard <laughs> we'll beat them. They'll be like, no mas, no mas. Jimmy Butler's even gonna be like, no mas. Just not show up. Let's put our second unit in. That, so, uh, oh, Cuban, nice. Some of that Cuban influence from <laughs> Jimmy Butler. So. Or he'll say it in a cowboy accent. <laughs> With all the country that fucker listens to. <laughs> oh, that's right. I was wondering what the fuck did that mean? And oh, then you explained man. the reference. Thank you. See, I'm, I'm not up to date with the player's taste in music. Uh, oh, I, I typically stick in the 90s hip-hop. So Don There Lewis, it is. You heard you know, it here. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, overall, I, I'll say very happy. We're both very happy about the results. Um, we think the Lakers are in a prime position uh, to win this. Um, we have to see what happens to Bam. We have to see what happens to Dragic. Dragic, I think that's his name. Yeah. Um, and uh, I hope. I, I expect yeah. him to play. It's the finals. Um, they, they got to. I mean. I don't know, man. Because because look, um, against this team that they're up against, like if I'm gonna play devil's advocate and put myself. You know, in the shoes of a Miami fan, put my shoes in the Pat Riley shoes, really big shoes. Uh-huh. You got to. It's three more games. If you give the Lakers one more, then you got to. You're digging yourself in a bigger hole. You know, and I get the it's fact the, that you know you don't yeah. want to exacerbate an injury, and you know there's always next year and whatnot. But you saw the battle they even had to face in the Eastern Conference. You're... But, but Don, I, I think you, you actually don't appreciate what you just said. You really don't appreciate that. I don't appreciate because... a lot of things in life, to be honest. But, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. We don't have to go down that <laughs> We don't want to make this overly depressing for our new audience. <laughs> what I was going to say is I don't think you fully appreciate what you just said because look what happened just last year. Look what happened just last year. Okay. Kevin Durant coming back from one of the worst injuries ever. And playing and getting hurt again with an even worse injury, yeah, an Achilles yeah, tear. Yeah. Okay, what's Bam's injury? Uh, I think it's it's TBD. We don't know for sure. Because um, I wasn't watching at that point. But I'm assuming it isn't a knee issue. Is it? No, no. It's uh, For him, it's something with like his, his arm, I think. Okay, so it's his arm, right? You got two arms. That's fine. What's Drogic's <laughs> issue? Uh. I, I think something with his leg. I don't know exactly okay. what, what happened. But. Well, the real X Factor is going to be in Bam. I think you and I can agree on that. Sure. Drogic, Drogic's going to be there, and he's definitely going to help facilitate the ball. But he won't be the reason why they win the series. I would. I think it's safe to say that Bam would be more of an X Factor, if not the X Factor, for the Heat. Because the severity of the injury, which I assume is not, you know, ACL, MCL related, PCL related, and it's possibly a finger, tape that sucker up, man, and just go for it. We shall see. Um, 
before in years past I would agree with you mm -hmm. but seeing what happened to Kevin Durant and knowing that it's because of that decision to come back and, and yeah. satisfy the fans and the organization the Warriors were kind of done you know it like, wasn't to satisfy the organization it was the heart of a champion trying to come out one more too. time that too it was that it too. was the fact that like he saw that his team needed him and we're seeing that right now it's not to the same severity or the same uh what's the word craziness uh, in, i don't i don't know magnitude like maybe magnitude, magnitude right? yes um but it's still like for the heat this is super meaningful to them this is no i, I get it justification I get it. for getting butler and doing all the things that he's done in his I, career I, I get it i get it but also you have to analyze it one of two ways is he going to be as effective playing with a splint over his hand. Who the hell is replacing him right now? It looks like Kelly Olynyk. Okay, so is Bam Adebayo with one arm is going to be more effective than Olynyk with his healthy body? I disagree. I, I disagree. think he would. Um... I think if you if you I don't know we're getting into the nitty gritty here, but if you look into Kelly Olynyk when he was playing bigger minutes, when not this yeah. past season, mm -hmm. but in years before, years before, he's okay. a very versatile player. Sure, um, he's a guy that can pass the ball like Bam. He's a guy that can switch a little bit on defense and he can score from three he can score mm. from everywhere on the court not at the same level of course as bam mm. but as a as a approximation of what bam brings to the table maybe let's say 70 percent of it i think he'll suffice he'll suffice for sure that's, that's and here's the truth here's probably something you're overlooking did you know eric spolstra over the past few months especially in the bubble he has basically reduced the rotation he has tightened it so that guys like Kendrick Nunn don't play. Yeah, so he, like, he has like a roster of like, or a rotation of like seven or eight. Exactly. Yeah. And now, it, 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 this ties into what you were saying. If Dragic is out, I believe you that they'll still find a way to win game because they have Kendrick Nunn. Part of the reason why Kendrick Nunn wasn't playing as much is because Dragic turned it on. The whole reason why I picked him on our little game is because he was playing really well. He was like the second best guard in Miami. And that's a tall order considering that the rookie, right, Tyler Hero, was nipping at his heels. And you also have another rookie, Kendrick Nunn, that he had to held back. So in total, I think Dragic may be missing the series, may not impact the game as much. Sure. But Bam Adebayo is critical. Without him, they can't win a game in my opinion. All right. So, so really quick, I just looked it up. Yeah. <clears throat> Olenek stats last year. Sure. He had a stellar 23 minutes, 10 points, 4.7 boards, mm -hmm. 1.8 assists. Sure. That's nowhere near Bam's numbers. Year before yeah. that, 23.5 minutes, 23.4 to be exact. Uh, rebounds, he was up at 6, mm -hmm. rounding up. Assists, sure. 3, rounding up. Steals, 1, rounding up. Blocks, half. And then even He's in good. the Celtics, it's worse. No, he's good. Like I, I don't even know what you're saying. Like he's actually a really good player. He's. I, um, I, I, I think I'd I'm say... having a problem that uh, you're comparing him to Bam. Dude, but maybe you... well, Bam hindered. Exactly. Okay. I think what I what I compared him to was sixty to seventy percent of Bam, which is what he would be <laughs> if he's hindered. And I think that's comparable. I think that's very comparable. Um, and, and the main point about Olenek is, I think he fits well in the Heat system, where he can do a little bit of everything. Um, he's versatile enough. Uh, he's a decent free throw shooter, so if he gets fouled, he's okay. I think he can kind of complement the other players that do need to step up more. I agree with you. You can't just make up what Bam contributes with one player. You need everybody, especially, in my opinion, Jimmy Butler. I think for the amount of leadership that he has and the amount of uh, respect that he demands, I think I need to see more from him. I understand he got hurt today, so I'm not holding that against him. But moving forward, if Dragic is out, which I think he will be, if Bam is out or hindered, I expect Jimmy to score 30 a night, find a way to do it, get to the line, get the Laker bigs in foul trouble, and, and basically make it a game. Because the same strategy, if they run it again game two, Miami has no shot. They might as well get swept. And that's what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm hoping for. As much as I love Jimmy Butler and what he brings to the or, or to basketball in general, um, 
it's about time we get the chip back and we're showing it it's not a it hasn't been an easy road um especially this year in the bubble and just throughout the season uh it's been a work in progress where we've gotten rid of subpar talent in order to level up with ad uh, it, it's time i think uh the miami heat are gonna require a miracle to you know even get more than one win even it to get certainly, that win, it say. certainly seems that way it certainly yeah. seems that way uh, and of course we would be perfectly fine with that uh i would be okay with the sweep to be perfectly honest i think um whenever the lakers are playing in a game that matters mm -hmm. um, especially in the playoffs i'm of the belief that just win as quickly as possible mm -hmm. don't stretch it out don't fuck up don't you know go easy one game just because you're up 3-1 or 3-2 whatever it is just um keep pushing all the way and and do it for kobe you know I know they're they're probably going to pay homage. They already are. I think a bunch of players are wearing Kobe sneakers mm -hmm. on the court. But keep pushing and know that you're not there yet. Yes, you are three games away from winning, what, the Lakers' 17th title? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, three games away from that. But don't focus on that. Just focus on game two, regardless of who comes out there from the Miami locker room. Push and, and kill them. Just dominate every game. And that would make... Kobe Brad, that would make the Laker fans just rally you from across the nation. And uh, we can't wait until the parade happens. I don't know what's not going to happen this year, but there should be a delayed parade. Yeah, maybe definitely, sometime, definitely. sometime next year. Yeah. I'll come out for that one for sure. I'll yeah. definitely come out. For I'm not sure about me, man. It's kind of far nowadays, so it's kind of far. Hey, who knows? Maybe they'll they'll do a parade in like a, a bus that just goes from city to city. Might even go to Brea. Might even go to Garden <laughs> Grove. You know? My, who knows? Maybe they'll do a Boonso event <laughs> next to this area. That might be fun. That might, that might get your ass over there. Oh, you know? well, definitely, because that paycheck's going to be massive. There you go. There you go. Got to make a lot of bowls that night, for sure. Hey, it's a lot worth of prep work. It. For sure. For sure. Um, speaking of worth it, I think one of the really good uses of my time yesterday was watching the first presidential debate between of course joe biden and our and, buddy well <laughs> donald j trump and uh don i just want to start you off with this one man like uh, what were your overall thoughts man what was your reaction to that spectacle it was first off not a debate mm. um it was prime time television prime time entertainment at best um, if I want to put my political hat on, it is not a promising spectacle to our leadership as the leader of the free world. It mm. felt like two kids or two old men, either one, take your pick, were just bickering at each other the whole time. And it was like, hey, he did it, so I'm going to do it. Oh, he did it first. No, you did it first. Stuff like that. I felt bad for uh, the moderator. I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, uh, was it Wallace? Chris Wallace? Wallace, Wallace yeah. I think. Yeah, something um, Wallace. Because he did his best, I would assume his best, to calm the <laughs> attitude, the, the harshness, the disrespect that was happening on that stage. Uh, but there was only so much you could do, uh, especially when you have the POTUS there, who will most likely try to find a way to fire him. He probably spent all day today trying to figure out a way to fire that guy or discredit him. Um, and it hurts knowing that Trump has the effect to even get Biden to stoop to that level. Um, one piece that really got me riled up was when trump was or biden was having his you know traditional two minutes um and trump said something about his son and then you know he was basically talking shit about biden's son and joe biden trying to you know protect his family had said repeatedly like my son 
my son, my son, while Trump continued to stomp him into the ground and dig him deeper, paint a worse picture than what's already out there in some people's minds. Uh, that got to me because it shows how disrespectful some people can be um, and it shows that Biden was a true family man regardless of his son's doings. I don't know. Yeah, um, I have a couple of issues with your earlier points, but we will address this part of the uh, debate, quote unquote. Um, it was clear, and it's always been clear, that Biden is most coherent when he's talking about his family. <laughs> Whenever it's personal, whether it's the tragedies that he suffered, or just talking about his current wife, his sons, you know, he always shoots from the hip, keeps it real, keeps it a buck. And that's when he doesn't stutter. Mm -hmm. That's when it comes out clear. Um, and it was a low blow, clearly a low blow. For One Trump. of many. One of many to not only attack his son, but to talk about his vices, the fact that his son had mm -hmm. succumbed to drug addiction. You know, something very, very personal that has nothing to do with Biden. Yeah. You know, nothing to do with politics. Nothing to do with politics at all. And I I liked and appreciated that Biden, you know, defended his son and said, yeah. hey, he fought that. He fixed it. Yep. And, you know, I, I love him. I, I love him. And, and that that's really what you want to hear from a presidential candidate, somebody who is very, very deeply caring about his family, um, always have them in mind even when they're not doing as well in life and the fact that trump would stoop to that level just kind of shows that it is no holds barred for him uh he does not respect any of the rules or decorum that we tend to expect from these debates between two candidates this is supposed to be it's supposed to be but it isn't two of the most qualified people for the position competing against each other in a dignified matter right but it's not like that. I think whenever Trump is in the picture, you are not going to get the status quo. You're not going to get what you expect from a civil conversation between two adults. It's going to it, be what you said. Either two old men bickering or two young children throwing tantrums. But I wanted to argue a little bit on the earlier points you made. You were saying that Joe Biden was almost equally firing at Trump, too. Really, the only things that stand out to me was when he got so frustrated that Trump kept berating him and interrupting yep. him mm -hmm. that he said, can you just shut up? Yeah, shut right? up, man. Will you shut up, man? Will you shut up, man? Or when so he called that... him a clown and it was like, oh, oh, actually. <laughs> yeah, person. I meant person. I thought that was, that was kind of funny. Like, you know. It was, it was a Freudian slip, man. And that's, that's what I meant. Like, for a politician, a seasoned politician to make those slips shows me that he stooped to that level. Trump got under his skin. Granted, I, I, it wasn't at the same level or the same yeah, that, levels that, of disrespect. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know? I think it's different here. I think it's all relative. Yeah. You could make the case that for Biden's standard, mm -hmm. this was a new low for him. Yes, yes. That's what I meant. I think, okay, yes. I, I agree with you there because Biden, he's characteristically polite and civil in most cases. A little too polite in some cases. Yeah. I agree. I agree in most cases. I mean, I look back <laughs> at his debate performances with the Democrats. Sure. Like, you know he was the the target for everybody. Well, Sleepy Joe, what do you expect? <laughs> I see that nickname has caught on in the <laughs> ball in my household. I see. <laughs> but next you'll be calling Pocahontas okay, randomly, man. too. Huh? You know? <laughs> you know, I, it's just... <laughs> I, I think here's the thing. Initially, though, I think Biden was trying to play it off as jokes, right? Yeah. You saw him smiling, yeah. grinning ear to ear, yeah. like every single time Trump would go well, ham. And I think it was because yeah. of the fact that, you know, uh, when it would be televised, people would see what he was up against. And I think that's why he was grinning. He's like, I got this in the bag. Look at how he's acting. The perception is half the battle, right? In some and, cases. And, no, and see, this is the this is the interesting thing, and this is probably where I might lose some fans. Uh, you always uh, I'm do. Just gonna, 
I, I, I tend to lose a few fans, and so, sadly they come back the next episode. But I'll say, um, you know, I understand that for a lot of people that I talk to, and even just reading some of the feedback after the debate, just online, it was ugly, and, you know, it was not really a debate. Biden probably didn't look as good. Trump probably didn't look as good either. But to me, I never really thought of this as being informative. I never really came into it thinking I was going to learn something about these two men. I'm of the belief, and maybe you are too, Don, that people who have already made up their mind to vote for Biden or to vote for Trump, this debate does nothing for them. You know, they'll yeah. just do what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I knew, well, like, I'm not, yeah. Go actually, ahead. no, there were a couple points that may stray certain opinions. Um, the one that I could think of and was on a couple headlines uh, this morning was Trump will not denounce white supremacists. Yeah, let's let's get into that actually. Sure. So I, I distinctly remember, mm -hmm. um, you know, Chris Wallace, the moderator. He was giving Trump a chance to just uh, condemn mm -hmm. the bad people on the sure. other side, and Trump sure. wanted specifics. Trump was like, name name them. Like, who who are you talking about exactly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I don't know if it was Chris Wallace that mentioned Proud Boys or, or Trump just came up with it off the dome, but his wording was very interesting, and I think the wording was very controversial. He said you know, uh, stand down, mm -hmm. acceptable, and then stand by. Mm -hmm. And so I think most people were like, huh, that's a very <laughs> peculiar way of saying, yeah, fuck you, white supremacist, right? That's a very weird way of saying that. No, I think it's the opposite. He was telling them or addressing them, speaking to them. Just like, say, hey, just hold on, just hold on. We got this. We got this in the bag. Just hold on. We we got this, right? huh? That's that's what he was saying, essentially. That's what a lot of I think that's what it yeah, that's what it kinda came off as exactly. too. Because like I, I understand that there is this perception and maybe it is true that Trump is a white supremacist and sure. he does support even if he's not a white supremacist, if he supports the rhetoric, he supports a lot of the movements and and whatever political activism that you know, these proud boys and other organizations are doing. Um, but my, I don't know, man. I, I, I think Trump is always saying shit and he knows that like, he has to kind of cover his base. Right. And he knows that he can't say anything to condemn white supremacy sure. because that will go against one segment of his base. Yep. So do you think in his own way, he wanted to say, yeah, everybody just just don't do anything to stop. But the way it came out was just so awkward yep. that because of the awkwardness, now people are misconstruing it and saying, "Oh, he's actually saying I'm on your side, but I want you to tone it down for now." Yeah, no, and I think that ask or that idea applies across all outlets. We just put a higher spotlight on Trump because he just said it, you know, so recently. Mm. I mean, uh, mm. there are people that write books for example and they had a simple idea but they go on and you know readers come up with multiple meanings where the author's like mm, nope it's just a simple story about a wizard who goes to high school and learns magic but then there's all these people that attach uh, other ideas that they've read into it too much on stuff like that so i think it could be said you know, in the same manner that during these debates, these few words that we get for that, what, hour? A little bit over hour an hour? Hour and a half. Right? Hour and a half. Yeah. Can definitely be misconstrued and misinterpreted from its potential true meaning. Uh, I guess we'll never know. Yeah, and it's not like, you know, either of us are defending Trump here. It's just, uh, you're not? you know. You sure? No, I, I'm, I'm not. It, I thought that's why you're going to lose fans, right? Because you're a Trump supporter? No, no, so the reason why I was going to lose fans <laughs> is because I actually didn't finish my first point. My first point was, um, you know, I understand that a lot of people, maybe those who haven't been following politics, they were kind of hoping to become informed sure. by watching this debate. Yeah. But me going into it, I was expecting a bloodbath. I was expecting a massacre. Sure. And I, I was expecting to be entertained. Yeah. Not, not informed, but entertained. Yep. And 
I'm surprised that more people aren't taking it this way. Like for me, this was just an hour and a half of just comedy gold. Sure. I mean, I, I was never going into it thinking, yes, this will actually change people's minds. No, not at all. I, I mean, whenever Trump is in a debate, you look back in 2016, not only against Hillary, but also against all the Republican senators, right? The Republican people that were on the stage with him, the 10 Republicans. He was a beast. He was just kind of slaughtering people left and right. And I decided to kind of suspend all of my dislikes and, I guess, problems with Trump's policies and just his human nature and just kind of see this as a boxing match, if you will. Like you have two heavyweights, one old, one slightly older, <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just going at it. And, yeah. um, you know, that, that was entertainment for me. I, I sure. Did you kind of see it that way too? Did you kind of view it as... A night of entertainment. I I knew it. I, I definitely well afterwards. I saw it as pure entertainment. Um, sure. But going into it, I did know there was going to be entertainment involved. Um, but I I had hoped that there would be substance behind the entertainment, and sadly there wasn't much to chew on. It's a shame. Um, I I will say, you know, in closing this segment, I will say that. Uh, to me, it seemed like Trump was very much prepared, not so much for a debate, but prepared to attack Biden on a personal level. Oh, yeah. Well, I think he's properly equipped to do that to anyone he has his eye on. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm pretty that, sure everybody does. Mm -hmm. With the right motive, you can set yourself up to be ill-equipped like that. Um uh, it's just that yeah. Trump doesn't have a filter, nor does he have the political kindness, the political sort decency. of norm, decency, decency to yeah. say it in a more politically eloquent approach. And, and the sad reality of the situation is I don't think any of this matters. This debate, the one next week, which I'm for sure going to watch, <laughs> and the other two, like, I, I, I like it for entertainment. Like, I'm unabashedly saying this. For me, it's comedy. But I don't think any of this matters in the real world in terms of voting. I think people have already made up their minds. Um, I, I don't know for sure what's going to happen. I, I'm, I would be remiss if I made a ill-conceived prognostication just like i did back in 2016 you know i thought for sure hillary was going to win but you know what happened now you may think trump has this in the bag for whatever reason but i think a lot of people out there are never trumpers and have grown into not again like maybe they voted for trump the first time sure didn't like what came out of it and they're not going to vote for him again. Got it. And it's impossible to really tell what's going to happen. You can look at the polls. You can see Biden leading in almost every state. Um, you could trust that. But ultimately, what, what it comes down to is what people do on on uh, Election Day, which, of course, is November 3rd. And, you know, Don, since everybody is doing a PSA, we might as well do one, too. So let's do a quick PSA for voting. Uh, you know, register. There's so many easy ways to register. Um, if you're in California, of course you should be getting your ballot sometime soon for uh, mailing it in. Um, Don, are you are you planning on uh, mailing in your ballot or turning it in in person at the polls? Oh, I'm not sure, man. I'm scared that mine is going to end up in a waste, uh, waste bin or uh, on the river or something like that. Ah, so you're, you're, you're pushing that already? No, Interesting. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm planning on uh, doing the mail-in. Got you. Yeah, me too. I, I've always done the absentee ballot because it's so much more convenient. You know, you fill it out early, uh, you mail it in, and you don't have to go to the polls at all, so that's fantastic. But obviously, whenever you're making these tough decisions, you're not just voting for the presidents. You're voting for uh, maybe senatorial seats, uh, congressional seats, maybe representatives, measures, uh, you know, local city council people, if you're in California. Um, so there's many things to consider. Mm -hmm. And just like, you know, for voting, uh, sometimes you have to weigh up many different considerations, seven in fact, before committing to war. And that, of course, is lesson number eight in... Oh, Jesus. In, uh, <laughs> in Ant, Ant-Man's The Ultimate Art of War. Um, of course, we are breezing through this at a snail's pace, probably. 
But for this lesson, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's quite long. But I will kind of summarize with the bullet points here. In order to gauge the chances of victory, a military leader has to honestly compare the allied forces to those of the enemy. Gather together the command group to discuss and assess the following points in great detail, using information obtained through intelligent networks. So leaving it there, I think we can make a perfect analogy to basketball, right? Uh, the, a big part of you know modern NBA basketball <clears throat> is scouts, right? <clears throat> you're scouting not only individual players, but you're also having the scouts watch game tape. You're watching tons and tons of footage. If you're Coach Spolstra, you're watching footage of Frank Vogel. You're watching the Lakers, you know, game after game against zone defenses because that's what the Miami Heat runs. And you're assessing how will the Lakers counter the zone defense? How will the Lakers, using their personnel, attack a Jimmy Butler, attack a Bam Adebayo? So it is very important to be considerate of not only your personnel, to know what they're capable of, but also what the enemy is capable of and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Sure. So um, what, what do you think about that, though? How important well, I think, do you uh, think it is? Miami yes. has one step up because Spolstra actually is a film review guru. Uh, he started off yes. in the organization as, what was it, like the, the guy who compiled it, basically? He was the AV guy. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. On top of that, uh, you have the spy on our team, known as Dion Waiters, who, regardless of who wins the title, is going to receive a ring. So, I believe Dion Waiters is spying on the Lakers for the Miami Heat. Not succeeding yet. Not succeeding. But he's, uh, what is that, an internal mole to our Laker franchise right now. That's interesting. I, I never really thought of it that way. Um, tell me this, though. Do you think Dion Waiters <laughs> should accept the ring? Yeah, of course. Why? Why, why should he accept the not? Him? Why he, he not? Didn't, he didn't play in the bubble, did he? Uh, that I do not know. He probably got garbage minutes, if anything, right? If anything. But even <laughs> J.R. Smith. J.R. Smith plays more than him. He got some minutes today. He got some minutes. Exactly. And um, beyond that, I, I think... Um, isn't it kind of just weird, right? Like, he was playing on both teams. He was Miami sure. Heat for, like, the first half. Yeah, it was like a Verjao all over again. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And didn't Verjao return the ring? He didn't accept it, right? Uh, I think because he got pushed back for it. Like, people saw him celebrating and all that. And uh, yeah. he got a lot of pushback. I think... Uh, I think it's kind of known... Uh, across the league and for those that follow basketball and treat it as their sport of choice for life um, those 10 through 15 players you know position 10 through 15 on the roster kind of are just there for the ride anyways so why not man if the owner and all the other supporting cast gets a ring I mean, you were there helping them practice, and you were there offering veteran knowledge to those that needed it. No, I get it. I, I get it, Don. I, I, I am not questioning whether or not the organization should present Dion Waiters with the ring. I think they definitely should. What no, I'm, I'm saying yeah, is, and I'm saying Dion should take it. Dion should take well, it. Well, I think, I think uh, maybe a better PR move would be to actually auction the ring and donate the proceedings to uh, some charity. I think that'd be pretty nice. Yeah, but is that his? It's gonna be his first ring, though, right? Yeah, but you know, I don't know if that I mean, means as much if he hasn't done anything on the team. Yeah, yeah, it won't have the same effect as Meta when he auctioned off his ring. Um, true, but true. I don't know. I think I, I, I'm a selfish person. I can admit that. If I were in Dion Waiter's shoes, uh, I would keep the ring. Um, because who knows the memories he created throughout his time with the organization. Um, and who knows if he passed a, you know, a, a certain move to the people getting minutes that give them success. Even if it's just, you know, two points throughout the bubble or th three points throughout the bubble. It's still two or three points. It was his contribution in some way, shape, or form. You know, um, 
But You're probably you know, right. You're mad probably respect right. though if he does do that, auctions it off and you know donates it to whatever charity he uh, feels best fit his uh, ideals. <coughs> I would just I think. Keep it. No, I, I think you're right, and I think he probably will keep it. And you also look at how it's not just the players that get rings, right? Mm-hmm. The uh, assistant coaches, all mm-hmm. of them get rings. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the even the training staff. Yeah, like the the I was gonna say the healer, but it's the, uh, <laughs> what, do, what do you call the the lady that uh, that one the one the athletic the trainers the athletic trainer. My bad, I was looking for that technical word. I I was settling on healers for some reason. <laughs> It's like a video game. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, sometimes oh, we uh, we all need a little healing, um, and uh, it, it's been it's been quite a 2020. But yeah. with the Lakers in the finals, maybe on the verge of winning their 17th title, I think things are looking up. Knock on wood. <laughs> knock knock knock. I think things are looking up, and I, I hope so. uh, I hope you know we just continue moving onward and upward, and. Um, you know, uh, until next time, we wish you all the best. We hope that the Lakers are up, what, they'd be uh, 3-0, right? Hopefully they're up 3-0 by then. And, uh, you know, hope you guys stay safe. Absolutely. And if you haven't, go ahead, register to vote. You still have time, I believe. So please do it. Your voice is needed. Until next week, guys. Peace.